Hello everyone, welcome back to all the mod 7 to the sky. Last time we generated some mana with Bataniel using the Spectrolus. We also built out hostile neural networks by setting up a bunch of simulation chambers and loot fabricators as well as a subnet on site for storage. And finally we began to look at the start of industrial forgoing, automating the production of latex and plastic. And you know, I was playing between episodes here just trying to clean up around the base and I noticed something. Lots of the processes around our base, especially the essentials, for example ingots, are still extremely, extremely manual. We are in fact still crafting pieces into raw ore and then smelting raw ore manually in furnaces. And not even the outputs are hooked up to our applied energistic system. Unacceptable, quite frankly. <laughs> so today we fix it. I have spent way too long in this elevator, but you know, <laughs> who doesn't love an elevator? Look at this thing. Alright, so I spent some time here building out the location of ore processing. Oh, that's never going to get old. That's so cool. Anyways, back to more productive things right here. So let me explain what the plan is. Right now from the sieve setups, we are getting uh, various materials, some of which we can just store as is. For example, things like redstone, we can just store as dust. Other things such as the ore pieces, the ingot pieces here, as well as things like Certus have to be processed further, right? We're not going to worry about the speed of the sieves. This definitely, definitely has to be increased. And in fact, I'm considering rebuilding this whole system up here, which is why I want the ore processing far away from it to give this thing some space. We can, however, transport the pieces and all the items that need to be processed through AE. There's a few other considerations we have to make when building this, RF production being one of them. Somehow we've managed to get away with this bigger reactor, generating, I think, a maximum of 7,500 RF per tick. Our base right now consumes a maximum of 3,000, I think it peaks at 3,500, and we're going to have a lot of machines down here, all of which consume power. So basically, in the beginning, things are going to be absolutely terrible, and we have to upgrade power and processing simultaneously. So I started by encoding some recipes for the machines that we would need, also Wandering Trader, and I came across the fact that we would need a lot of mechanism alloys. I was thinking, you know, we'll just batchcraft a lot of this stuff, but... No, that's not how we do things around here, is it? We need this stuff automated. So I began to build out the first of our machine corridors, just next to our terminals. We give a pattern provider for each machine. We extend over the AE connection and hook up a P2P tunnel. Link it all back to the controller. And after that, we're good to go, right? Well, not exactly. You see, I've got these machines set up, we're doing the metallurgy confusers. So the way these work is we need to give it a catalyst of some sort. There is carbon, redstone, obsidian here, tin and diamond. However, the problem we're running into here is we're directly extracting from these enrichment chambers. For example, redstone just goes down to the metallurgy confuser. To make refined obsidian, we need to use the enriched diamond first, which will permanently tie up this metallurgy confuser here. Basically, what I'm getting at is we need to rethink this design if we're going to switch to passive. The original thought was to do all of this on demand. It's perfectly fine if you don't get it first time. I rarely get things right the first time. <laughs> but it's good at an early stage to redo it. And we're going to use laser IO for this as well. So instead, what we're going to do here is replace the pattern providers with output drawers. That way, we're going to have our enrichment chambers on top of that. With downgrades in all these drawers, we don't need to buffer that much enriched material. We'll have to switch the positioning of these laser nodes. And we want to give each one an energy card to supply the machine with energy, and also an item insertion card. Then we hook all of these up to the master node. This input node is connected to an interface which supplies all of the input items, as well as power on the right hand side. However, we do also want to make sure we filter these enrichment chambers, and we can do that using these basic filter cards from Laser.io. Alright, so we got everything here filtered, there's two more machines, two crushers, with two more laser nodes. These things have to be insert the back, output the bottom, same as the rest of the machines on the line. And we want the first crusher to make tin dust. We are going to be getting ingots from our ore processing system. I think, anyway. I haven't fully decided on that. I'll explain what I mean by that later on. And we also have to crush obsidian to obsidian dust. Or apparently we can't crush obsidian like this. Oh, it has to be an enrichment chamber. That's interesting. All right, we can do that. And finally, two more downgrades. We don't need to buffer that much. Make sure to lock all the drawers as well. And finally, we want to link all these drawers to a storage controller, which we can put here. 
You guys commented that you don't actually have to have the controller touching the drawers. Let's see if that's the case. It looks like they're all linked. That's cool. That means we can put the storage buds right here. High priority. Awesome. So now we have access to all of the enriched material. Well, almost. They're still refined obsidian. We have to set up our metallurgic infusers. Those are going to go on the opposite wall right here. Hey, what you doing down there? Join yourself? Oh my goodness, this mod is the best thing ever. Yes, I think, I, okay, I found what we want to do here. So I noticed that there was this thing called the counting filter. This is effectively like the limited item filler from Ender.io. It allows you to specify exactly how much of an item you want to keep in a single inventory. I really want to buffer as few diamonds as possible. I think we're down to our last like 500. 460 we're on with everything in the buffers and whatnot. Yeah, that's going to be perfect. In fact, I think I might switch this one out here. It does ignore the fact that it turns into liquid whenever it goes into the infuser. But above that, we don't want to have like 64 full diamonds in here, plus whatever's in the drawer, plus whatever's in the enrichment chamber. And an extra like 30 minutes of filtering, we got this. Once again, we have over-engineered this thing to be like way more complicated than it needs to be. But this is the most fun way to play, I think. So basically what we've done here is we have things passively being produced for us. This is something I've learned from mostly Greg Tech Packs, but I used it very heavily in Divine Journey as well. If you can get things to be made before you even need it, then it saves time in the long run, even if you have to invest more time up front to set it up. So the first infuser here enriches redstone with osmium to give us basic control circuits. We don't want this to run forever though, right? But we do want to hold more than one stack. We could downgrade the drawer, but there's a few instances here where it relies on chain crafting. So to keep it consistent, we're going to use level emitters for this. So if basic control circuits are less than 128, we want to invert this, emit when levels are below, then it emits a redstone signal, and this is only active with a redstone signal. So the level emitter basically just reads the contents of the AE system that it's connected to. Because we have all of our drawers connected to this controller with a storage bus on, AE effectively has these items in its inventory, therefore it can read from this drawer and turn off the machine when we have too much of this. Next infuser infuses iron with redstone. This gives us infused alloy. Except this time, we'll say when infused alloy is below 256, we want, a th I think, a slightly bigger buffer on this. Actually, no, we're running low on iron. We'll do 128. That's two stacks. Next one infuses enriched diamond with obsidian. This gives us refined obsidian used in the enrichment process over here. So this one, we're just going to buffer 64. The next one infuses enriched diamonds with infused alloy. That's this one over here. So that this is the chain crafting that I'm talking about. So again here, because this is expensive, I'm just gonna buffer 64. We have already some batch crafted. Next two are for making steel. The first one enriches iron with carbon, and the next one enriches enriched iron with carbon, which gives us enriched iron dust and steel dust. So I think we'll just buffer 128 of this enriched iron. There are some uses for this for mechanism reactor glass. And the steel will just buffer 64, but we'll change this out once we have smelting set up because we want to automatically turn this into ingots, I think. I haven't decided what we're going to do about dust to ingots yet. The last one on the line here is for bronze, which is enriched tin and copper dust. Or it looks like we can use copper ingots for this. Oh yeah, and the reason we have two nodes on each machine here is because we need one for the input and one for the catalyst. So moving on, before we can even start to process the ores, we do need to produce a few liquids and gases. The first one being hydrogen chloride. This is used in order to make shards. The shards we then send through a purification chamber with oxygen, something else we have to make. That's then going to give us clumps. Then we crush that for dirty dust. Then enrichment chamber for clean dust. And smelt for ingots. If you're familiar with mechanism ore processing, then there is a few steps that we've actually missed out here. Or we're going to miss out. You can technically squeeze out a little bit more yield if you, first of all, chemical dissolution chamber the raw ore. However, that is going to add a lot to the power cost and we need to produce sulfuric acid for that to work. Then you have to chemical wash it, then chemical crystallizer it, and then you're, you're onto the hydrogen chloride step. So maybe something we'll come back to. But for now, what we want to do here is make our hydrogen chloride. Annoyingly, this multi-block is 4x4. Four four. <laughs> I always hate centering this thing, but it has to be done. So we need a controller. It can go on any of the walls except the corner. We also need a valve. Actually, we need three valves for this. We'll put them all on the, on the same side, I think. 
and the rest just has to be the thermal evaporation blocks. This can be a maximum of 18 blocks tall, I think. We don't have 18 blocks to work with, so I'm hoping that we can make it fast enough for our needs. There we go, we got the particles, so we have a multi-block structure. So we need to mix hydrogen with chlorine. The hydrogen will come back to it. To make chlorine, we need to use the electrolytic separator and separate brine. The brine we get from this thermal evaporation controller, which we can get if we input water. We are gonna use a sink for this and a fluid pipe. Set this to extract and give it an upgrade. Now we have to heat up this thermal evaporation plant. We can do that with a resistive heater. So we give this thing a flux point. We can specify exactly how much RF we want it to use. The more RF we give it, the higher heat it will generate. And then the faster the brine we get. It looks like it's already not too bad with just 40 RF per tick. Yeah, and it's continuing to heat up. Let's give it a bit more height for some more capacity. We're short. All right, so now that we have our brain, we want to, I think we want to buffer this. And then we want to send it into an electrolytic separator. And you know what? I think since we're already relying a lot on AE, we continue to rely on AE. It served us well thus far. <laughs> so I think we're, we're actually going to look into fluid energistics. Oh, and it, they changed the texture again. I think for brain, we're going to be okay just storing it in a 1K. We'll definitely want to partition this though, so we need a bucket of this. I don't know if we can grab it directly. Looks like we can. So we want to name this thing, we can do it in the labeler. Thank you for, the, for your comment reminding me this was actually possible. It's like a free anvil. And of course we can partition it in the cell workbench with a bucket of brine. And at some point we have to move these ME drives, we'll set up a server room. But right now we'll just separate this out as our fluid storage. And is there still the fluid terminal? Does that... It doesn't exist. Hmm, I wonder if they integrate it into the regular terminal. That would be pretty cool. I know that they integrated fluid storage buses into regular storage buses, so they are now inter interchangeable. So on the remaining valve, we can place a ME interface. And one more fluid pipe. Of course there's water inside here. <laughs> because of the sink. Okay, I think if we break this though, it's gonna void it. Yeah, replacing it gives us the brine. Now we just have to hook this up. If it disappears, it's gonna go into the cell. Perfect, nice. All right, so do we see it in the terminals now? We do, that is so cool. Oh, I love that you don't need a separate, separate terminal now. Awesome. I love Minecraft version 1.12, but you cannot deny the fact that Mechanism now supports sided machines. Sided gas inputs. Oh my goodness, what a nightmare trying to get these things placed the right way before. And I was going to say, it's going to make for a very simple setup here, but either I've encountered a bug or I'm doing something wrong here. So we got the double electrolytic separator set up, except in the brine from our AE system. And I was going to have this output to another interface, the chlorine, but I can't get this to go in any cell. I've got a gas cell and I've got a fluid storage cell here. And both the chlorine or the sodium does not want to go into AE, no matter what I've tried here. If you guys know what I'm doing wrong, please let me know. But we need a workaround for today. So I think we're just gonna use gas tanks as a buffer. These guys, but the upgraded versions. And the upgrades for these gas tanks take all of these alloys that we set up earlier on. By the way, I did clean up this room. I think it's looking pretty awesome. I added on atomic alloy, something that we were missing on the end. And because of that, we have the materials before we even need them. Awesome, so let me fix this setup down here. I am a little bit concerned about our power consumption now. Let's see what we're at. 4.4 it looks like we're averaging actually. We're kind of pushing it here and we've not even began ore processing yet. But let me show you what we've got so far. We'll take the elevator down since that's the, the most impressive way to enter this space. Oh, I love this thing so much. You know what it needs though? Oh, you know what it needs? Hold on. Yes, <laughs> it's not perfect, but that's exactly what I needed. Anyways, enough fooling around. I think I got all the liquids and gases made up here. Anyways, from the electrolytic separators, we separate brine and we get our chlorine and we also get sodium around the back in these two tanks here, which are dumping excess. Really, really nice feature of these chemical tanks. On the bottom of the chlorine tanks, we also have a storage bus, which is specifically partitioned for only chlorine and on high priority. The storage bus allows us to send it to this interface here, very, very slowly. I think chlorine is the bottleneck actually, where it gets mixed with hydrogen. And this gives us our hydrogen chloride at the front. Again, with the storage bus on the bottom and the high priority. And we get the hydrogen from two more electrolytic separators, just separating water. We get hydrogen and oxygen this way. And an extra two storage buses on the ones on the back here for oxygen. As of course we need oxygen in our ore processing system here. The rates right now, especially on hydrogen chloride, I think because of chlorine is a big bottleneck. No doubt we'll have to speed up this system, but let's move on for now. Let's start processing some ores, finally. Before we begin, there is one thing I want to just test. The first step in our process is the chemical injection chamber. 
and I was just double checking some recipes here. I noticed there was a recipe for salt. Is this? Oh my goodness, no way. <laughs> it gives us hydrogen chloride directly. Does this mean that this evaporation setup is completely unnecessary? We have 17,000 salt. We get this from sifting something or another. It looks like sand. Although I did put in a stack and that only gave us like 190, I think it was. And every recipe is going to be 200, I believe. Yeah, 400 millibuckets actually. So so yeah, I don't think the 17,000 salt is going to last very long. Doing it this way, we have a lot more headroom to expand. Okay, that's good to know. Okay, so first thing we want to do is establish what we actually want to process, right? So I guess we've got gold, copper, tin, osmium, lead, silver, iron, nickel, aluminium, uranium, iron is a duplicate, zinc, gold is a duplicate, cobalt, although cobalt I think might be a special case. No, it looks like it can be processed this way. Anything else? I guess platinum. Yeah, okay, that's not too bad. So we have to start by transporting those to the start of the chain here. We're gonna have, I think, just two interfaces to begin with, two on each side. And in each of these interfaces, we can request these ores. We'll do around half in each. We also want to make sure we set the stock amount to 64, just so that it can buffer a little bit more in the interface, as eventually we'll be pulling stacks at a time. We gotta make sure that we plug these in. We should still have channels here, we're only using 10. Now we have to 2x2 two two craft these into raw ores. I think this flux compactor is gonna be the very fastest thing we can make, at least when we have it upgraded. So we can have four of those on each side to start. We'll have to give these things RF, which we can provide underneath. And maybe we actually move these things down a block so that we can hide the energy pipes. Yeah, I quite like that idea, like this. And then we can just flux point, set the pipes to extract, and give them both an upgrade. Oh, our great idea has to be reversed here. <laughs> I just remembered these things auto output to the bottom, and it has to be the bottom. So I guess energy is going on top. Aha, uh -huh. something like this should be fine. We've got the outputs going into some unlocked drawers connected to the drawer controller. Now then, we're going to be getting raw iron, for example. We could toss this straight into the injection chamber to get our shards. It's going to cost us 200 hydrogen chloride for three. However, I noticed if we actually compact this into blocks, we can reduce the cost down to 400 for nine. So it saves us a bit on hydrogen chloride, which I have a feeling we'll be short on. So to do that, we need to 3x3 three three craft them this time. And just for the aesthetics, we're going to go with molecular assemblers. We gotta make sure we plug these into AE to give them power. Fortunately, these actually don't consume any channels on their own. The downside is we do have to specify recipes for them. Unless maybe we use a crafting card, but crafting cards are banned. <laughs> crafting cards belong in lava. Never ever ever use crafting cards. Yeah, I think we'll have one molecular assembler per ore type, and we just need to encode all of these recipes. Twice, actually. Awesome, so now that we've got the recipe in each one, all we have to do is pipe from the drawer controller. We don't want it to connect to this drawer here, since this will be an unlocked drawer. And the molecular assembler should only accept the ones that its recipe can handle. So we should just be able to do this along each one. And set to extract from the drawer controller. The storage controller, I always call it a drawer controller. Okay, let's go for our first test. I'm not ready to unleash everything from this AE interface. But we will have some pipes which go along like this. By the way, does anyone know the correct tool for these mechanism pipes? Apparently there is no tool, but I wonder if there's a wrench or something that works. Wait, maybe there's a wrench mode on this thing. Oh, there is. Nice. Yeah, so if we put iron pieces in here, it should compact. It's very slow without upgrades. Yep, it does. Does it then go into the molecular assembler? Yes, is the answer. What about the outputs? It might be necessary to put these things on subnets. I have a feeling this is going to go directly back into our main drives. It doesn't go anywhere. That's not what I was expecting. Well, maybe that means we can just pipe out from these things as well. Maybe just for safety, we add a quartz fiber underneath just to make sure they stay within this confined processing line. Now that we've got the blocks of raw ore, we have to send these into our chemical injection chambers. Honestly, I have no clue how many we'll need. Maybe we just start with two per side. The idea with this whole system is we can stack it vertically if we need to expand. These things will also need an interface here to supply the sodium... No, not sodium. Hydrogen chloride. We should just be able to request it in the interface. Very good, these are all filling with hydrogen chloride. We hook up the item inserts from the back and power up both sides like this. <laughs> Is this supposed to be making this sort of a noise? Oh, no way. It looks like blocks of raw zinc don't have a recipe like this. Oh, why not? Come on, game. <laughs> Oh, this complicates things a lot, actually. How many others don't have recipes with the blocks? It looks like Platinum doesn't. Oh, this is going to be a big rewire job.
You know, it actually wasn't too bad of a rewire. We did have to switch from mechanism over to XNet. And we've removed some of... Oh my goodness, this guy again. So the switch to XNet was made because we need to be able to filter the inserts. As far as I know, we can't do that with the mechanism pipes. Because of course we want to prioritize sending things into the molecular assemblers to craft them into blocks before they go into the chemical injection factories. The recipe for the raw ores is three at a time. Yeah, it has to be sent three at a time. As far as I know, we can't have a minimum transfer rate, only a maximum transfer rate. And I think that applies to laser IO as well. If you, go if you guys know of a mod that can actually do that, let me know. For now, the workaround is just to have more chemical injection chambers, just so that we don't have one type of item fill in the slots here. And then the rest of the chain after the injection chambers, it just goes to a purification chamber with the oxygen, again supplied by the interface, then into a crusher, then into an enrichment chamber, then into an ender chest down here, and it joins this drawer network here where we store the clean dusts. So yeah, the processing rate right now is absolutely awful, but we are approaching our maximum limit on power. We can't really go much higher this episode. One thing that does really, really help though is gas upgrades. I made sure to max this out. I think it has a 10x reduction of cost. I think that's what it means. In any case, it saves a lot on hydrogen chloride and on oxygen. And it means that we're now net positive with our producers at the rate that we're now processing the ores. Or maybe not. Why doesn't it have war? Yeah, there's definitely nothing in there, right? I don't know. Okay, can you guys spot the difference between these two images? Because I, <laughs> because I sure didn't when I built it. And I had to move everything on, on the right hand side over a block, so that was a fun time. Anyways, before we wrap up this episode, there's one thing I would like to take care of over at Batania. Oh, it looks like it has already stopped. Hold on, let's get rid of the rain. The same day we set up the Spectrolis, I did implement a quick turn off for this thing. Underneath here where the ender chest is, we have a stockpile switch which emits a redstone signal based on the fill level of the ender chest. However, it was pointed out that this is quite flawed because there is some randomness in the flower types that we generate. So it could be potentially the case where we this is filled up with white flowers and all the rest are empty. That's an extreme edge case which is probably never ever going to happen, but you get the idea, right? We need a second way to detect whenever these drawers are full. The void upgrades on the drawers wouldn't work since that means that we couldn't buffer the flowers or the petals. Everything is automatically crafted all the way down to the die. So I want to thank Lith on Discord for giving me this idea. What we're going to do here instead is use more integrated dynamics for this. But this is actually quite a simple fix. Check this out. So this is the ender chest that's connected underneath there. What we do is implement a second drawer network. We just need four 2x2 drawers to handle the 16 different colours. Yeah, we want to lock all of these, connect them all up to this drawer controller. We change the XNet controller to buffer from the inner chest into this one first, then into the main storage controller of the main storage. Just got to change up some of the channels here. And we give each color its own space in the drawer. And we can give these ones the void upgrades and storage downgrades to hold, only hold one stack at a time, one stack of each. Then we can just have an inventory reader on the drawer controller, a variable store, and a redstone writer here. Then we can just grab the variable inventory full. This is going to give us a boolean. So if this drawer network is full, then we want to send the redstone signal to this redstone writer, which will emit a redstone signal into the world. We can grab this redstone link, which was previously on the stockpile switch. It's basically just wireless redstone signal from create. And we can link this up to the gray channel. Gray channel is then connected to this pulse mana spreader. We're basically just going to be hard power in this thing. And when you do that, it will ignore the signal from the hourglass, meaning that it won't ever send any more mana to the drum of the wild and the flowers will just end up filling this field which is fine the main thing is that we don't want entities lying on the floor and that should take care of overflow protection very very important that we do that last thing is to switch the inventory reader by default it checks every one tick of the game that's way too frequent i think we can just turn it up to like 500 or turn it down to 500 so that it doesn't have to check the storage controller as frequently and that will just reduce lag a little bit and with that, guys, I think it's also a good point to wrap up the episode. Next time, we'll look into some power. I don't know if we go straight for the mycelial generators or if we look at some sort of intermediate like power. Yeah, the reactor mod power. Power? Power? <laughs> I don't know. Oh, look, he's back. Or is it just a single llama? I guess this was the survivor. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next episode.